the previous class we had a discussion about uh, energy geotechnics that is the energy pile concept and before that I was discussing about scope of the environmental geomechanics or environmental geotechnics. We had elaborate discussion on various aspects of environmental geotechnology as such. Now, moving on this problem we have been discussing since long and uh, it basically deals with the uh, how the contaminants spread in geo environment which could be saturated unsaturated rocks which could be intact or fractured and the water table or the ground water. So, all these constituents constitute of geo environment in which the contaminants are going to spread. Once you have an activity like landfill where the land uh, mass is being filled up with the waste which is toxic or hazardous. And when it comes in contact with rains, this is what is known as waste environment interaction. Now, this is something which uh, most of us are trying to study in details that how waste environment interacts. Sometime back uh, when I started guiding one of my PhD scholars on this topic, I in my first meeting with him, I told him that when two friends meet, what is the body language of both? At the same time, <coughs> when two people who are not very friendly they meet with each other what happens. I can create 4, 6 combinations out of it. See there could be a situation the moment you see me you feel excited you know the, oh seeing you after so many years and there could be a situation when I see you my blood pressure shoots up. Is this possible or not? It happens person becomes nervous. So, all these symptoms which human body exhibits when it interacts with another human body could be inspiring factor to deal with a situation when waste is interacting with the environment. This interaction could be very conducive. At the same time, this interaction could be extremely an extreme. Fine. So, these are the two things which are very philosophical and industrial byproducts are being thrown in the geo environment constituting of the waste material and then this is starts interacting with the environmental system. Then most of us are interested in understanding how to quantify this type of a process, what type of sentiments, emotions are exhibited by both of them and how to capture them. So, you must have seen these photographers and videographers, they make a video or they make a photo of the friends meeting each other. Can we take a photograph of when waste is interacting with the environment? <coughs> Can we digitize it? Can we quantify it? So, these are the questions which come to the mind of researchers, fine. So, this is becoming a very big subject, waste environment interaction. There is a guy who did his PhD with me, Dr. Srinivas Kadali. So, his thesis is very philosophical and there we have created four type of situations and we have published that work quite a lot and we have tried to define how geo environment and byproduct interaction takes place and what really happens because of this interaction. Those of you who are interested they can uh, read this. Many a times science and technology becomes philosophical. It becomes a philosophy of technology, philosophy of science, philosophy of engineering. So, we go more into these things. So, when this interaction occurs, all of you are aware that the leachates generate and these leachates pollute the geo environment. Now, the question is how to deal with this situation? We have been analyzing the situation since long and then I discuss about the four major activities of a geo environmentalist clear first he tries to understand what type of waste is being generated he wants to characterize it he wants to handle he wants to store it and the moment the storage takes place like this it comes in contact with the environment the contaminants generate and these contaminants migrate into the geo environment so this is what is known as contaminant migration the third thing is that we want to curtail this process so we want to contain it clear this is what is known as containment. The fourth major step was if I cannot contain and even then leak takes place, slick occurs, contamination takes place, how to overcome this situation? We remediate it. 
fourth issue and then we were talking about these 3 r and these 3 r became 4 r. So, you talked about the reduce concept. So, if you look at the evaluation of technology, we are trying to reduce the whole process of contamination generation, but it is a very expensive issue. Most of industries have to function 100 percent efficiency, clear? Most of the industries have to be renovated completely. The industries which are running since last 50, 60, 70 years, they have to be completely written off and we have to install their state of the art units, processing units which is going to be extremely expensive. Now, this is where the clash between what technologists recommend and what industrialists follow starts. Did you get this point or not? The clash between the society and its components is there is some recommendation which cannot be followed. So, suppose if I write a recommendation that all these plants should be revamped with the latest possible furnace technology, the furnaces should be changed. Now, who is going to change that is a big question. So, we always try to simulate the worst possible condition where a lot of waste which is generated is interacting with the environment and now the question is if this type of situation occurs, what should I do? So, we debated upon this and some of you were saying this situation is better and some of us are saying that the next situation where the plume flows to the in the direction of the groundwater is better. Now, as a geotechnologist, what can be done? So, you want to confine it, how would you confine it? It is easier to say rather than execute, clear? Now, this layer might be extending up to hundreds of meters or 50 meters or 20 meters or tens of meters, fine. So, how would you do this? So, your answer is correct, I would like to confine it. So, one of the ways in which the confinement can be done is you create containment scheme. So, what I have shown here is I have shown a barrier system. Now, those of you who might be interested in studying this further, this is the latest word, you know, it is a very fashionable term which is being used in today's geoenvironmental engineering barriers. Until now, you were aware of only barriers for let us say transportation system, clear? But now, everybody is talking about geoenvironmental barriers. I want to impede the spread of contaminants, clear? I want to create thermal barriers where the heat will not migrate from one point to another point. This is what we were discussing in the previous lecture when Martin was talking about thermal piles and one of you had asked a question that how would you isolate the whole area so that the heat does not migrate out of the system or does not migrate into the system. So, these type of barriers which you are talking about are these solutions, you can contain the entire area, isolate it from rest of the world, clear? Now, the question is what type of containment I should be providing? So, this is where we talk about sheet piles, have you heard about sheet piles? Some of you I am sure, fourth year students. So, these are the piles of very stiff steel and they could be 1 meter wide and they could be extending up to 10 to 15 meter long and they are typically about 6 mm, 8 mm thick and there is a complete technology to insert these type of sheets into the ground. So, you must see in YouTube type sheet pile insertion and I am sure you will get lot of videos. So, the whole thing can be you know tamped into the ground and this is where if I connect it all around, it becomes a confinement or a containment. So, sheet piling is a good solution. Yes. Good. So, we will be talking about area of influence also. So, we will have to estimate what is the area of influence. So, this this should be estimated definitely, otherwise you will not be knowing what should be the radial distance at which the containment should be done. Yes, this is a interesting question. So, there are a lot of techniques which people are following these days. They are doing piling, they are doing sometimes trenches. They cut very deep into the ground and they fill it up with bentonite slurry. So, these type of techniques are uh, nowadays being adopted by professionals. They are very expensive, but they give you the good solutions. Now, let us talk about the second situation. What should be done with this type of situation? Unfortunately, nothing much can be done and this is where your point comes. Remember, long back we were discussing about the 
environmental impact analysis. That means, if I do some activity over here and it spreads up to a certain distance, I have to tell to the authorities that you know whatever industrial activities I am going to do, what is the impact of these industrial activities on the geoenvironment. So, this is where we try to estimate what is the extent of migration of this plume and this is where mathematical modeling takes over the philosophical discussions which we are having until now. So, from this point onwards environmental geomechanics starts fine. Until now I was talking about the environmental geotechnics. So, my intention is not too much into to ven venture into environmental geomechanics because this is a specialized subject and this being exposure discussion or course I am not going to overload you by giving all your details, but yes the trivialities I will be discussing. So, that you know what is the application of whatever you have studied until now in this type of uh, problem solving. So, basic question is as he rightly said up to what extent this plume will go. I would like to monitor it as an experimentalist. Later on what happens is all of us we go up to a certain distance in life in our profession and then we branch out you know one of us becomes experimentalist, one of us becomes numerical modeling guy, third one becomes only monitoring guy. There are very few combinations we will find that 1, 2 and 3 are being done by the single person. This is extremely difficult because one of the components of the 3 itself takes you whole life to master or to understand at least 10 percent of it, 90 percent still remains unknown. The monitoring is an issue which is picking up these days because of very stringent environmental laws. So, suppose there is a Kanjurmag landfill next to IIT Bombay and there might be a PIL, you know PIL, public interest litigation and you must be seeing intentionally these builders are building infrastructure very close to these facilities. 10 years back if you would have come to Bombay you must have realized all these were salt pans, nobody used to dare to go there fine. This road which is connecting Gandhinagar to Kanjurma, I started doing maybe 1998. We started dumping small small debris and then this was a strip of 1 meter and now today you see it has grown up to almost 80 meter wide. So, the point is all these places where habitation did not occur earlier has become a prime pr property today. You are getting the point? Because these are the lands which were not easily approachable by the people. They were all slush, marsh, waterlogged areas and we are not having these technologies to go and venture into those areas. But with the advent of modern technology what has happened? People have started utilizing these lands which were lying unattended. So, there is a subject in geomechanics which is normally taught as you know soft clay engineering. I do not know whether you have studied or not. Soft clays are the clays with very very low shear strength or let us say you know SU parameter you remember undrained shear strength of the soil it will be hardly 10 kPa, 15 kPa, 20 kPa. So, now, coming back to the point monitoring is becoming very very important issue in today's profession because whatever activities are being done somebody has to monitor and challenge. So, there could be a person who may say that your activities are spoiling my field PIL, RTI all right. So, all these type of legislations which have been created by the governance are creating a lot of awareness in people and hence monitoring is becoming a very very important thing. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have good monitoring tools in India yet and there are very few people who have expertise to monitor different mechanisms and the parameters. So, we require more and more number of laboratories in the country. So, at least you know each each city should be having at least 5 to 6 laboratories where the samples could be taken, checked, monitored and so on. Now, this is also a part of the entrepreneurship where people with the help of the government funding should have advanced laboratories like we have so many pathological laboratories in the country clear, but we do not have any laboratory where samples of the soils rock and groundwater can be tested easily. Truly speaking this is what is causing people to become sick. So, we are taking extra care to health, but not to the cause which is responsible for this to happen.
So, the basic intention of monitoring is I want to understand in time and distance domain what is the impact of the contaminant and this is what we say sometimes as spread of contaminant, fate, fate of contaminants. When I am doing monitoring, I would like to study the parameters in time domain and space domain. So, the simple possible form would be let us say if I am dumping some concentration over here at a distance of x, y, z and t what will be the concentration of the chemicals. If I have radioactivity and if I have the count of the radioisotopes at this point disposal point, I would like to understand the count of the radioactivity at a distance of x, y, z and t fine. So, later on I will also talk about the attributes of the contaminants. So, until now I have given you only two attributes that is the concentration and radioactivity. The third one could be heat. Most of the time when industrial processes are taking place and the sludges which are being disposed of they are at very high temperature. So, imagine if a effluent is being discharged on the ground or in the ground and this effluent spreads the initial temperature is let us say T naught or theta naught. I would be very eager to know at x, y, z and t what is the temperature where these type of things become very important. These type of issues become very important in most of the thermal power plants. It is one of the examples of yes see this is your power plant fine. How many of you have been to BSES Danu from where the electricity comes to Bombay? See these are the places where you must have noticed this structure. Now basically this is a cooling channel. So, when you are running these power plants, why these power plants are close to water bodies? Any idea? So, water is the coolant and how much water is required to run your turbines and maybe to cool the turbines and the entire power plant millions of liters per day. So, it is basically a closed loop system because sea water cannot be used, river water cannot be used directly into the turbines why correct due to contamination or water might be heavy which will go and do pitting of the entire machinery and it will cause lot of damages. So, water becomes very precious. Now, the issue is that these type of channel which I am trying to show you are known as cooling channels. Why they are required? Though there is a sea nearby, one is this reason you cannot use the sea water, you cannot throw anything which is very hot into the water because you rightly said it is going to affect the biodiversity of the offshore environment. So, imagine the aqua life is going to flourish at a certain temperature 40 degrees centigrade and you are dumping the effluent there at a temperature of 150 degree centigrade or 200 degree centigrade or 100 degree centigrade. So, this is not fair. So, this is the reason you know all most of these industrial processes you have to take care of the temperature issues. So, one of the attributes of the discussion which we are doing about the contaminants is temperature. So, concentration of the chemicals radioactivity associated with this temperature fine. Next one any guess? what it could be. Nowadays, it is a fashion to talk about biological fluxes, microbial activity. So, these are four issues which normally people talk about. So, we talk about monitoring of these parameters concentration, radioactivity, thermal gradients and bioactivity in terms of spread in time and space domain. We are interested in knowing what is the intensity. Intensity has something to do with the toxicity or hazardicity which we discussed long back. That means, if the concentrations of these attributes are more than the permissible limits, they all become toxic. Toxicity could be of chemical nature, radioactivity, it could be of bio nature, thermal normally we do not use the word, but you know colloquially we can use the word thermally also it may become toxic. 
A good example is you sit very close to the furnace or a heater, you have to maintain certain distance. You cannot just keep on coming close and close what is happening, you know your skin will get affected. So, this is what the whole scenario is. So, what environmental geotechnologists do is they just deal with these four or five steps and who will believe what you have done, whatever data you have generated. So, this is where we start doing modeling. So, all these numerical modeling courses which are being taught to you, different type of software which you use is a big business. Each software you buy is each module is going to be around 5 lakhs, 6 lakhs, 8 lakhs. Have you used Comsol? Anybody here? Anyway, these softwares are very expensive, it is a million dollar industry, billion dollar industry now. Huh? Okay. So, GIS is also fine, that is a package which is used for people uh, by people who are into remote sensing and data generation and all these things. Plexus is one, yes, Abacus is one. Dyna is one, in soils, ANSYS, ANSYS is normally used for finding out the load deformation characteristic mechanistic models. ANSYS does not talk about, oh sorry, it talks about thermal gradients also, you can analyze it, correct. So, there are recent softwares which can take care of all these attributes like, I do not know whether you heard about soil vision, geoslopes, mod flow. So, these are the software which normally are being used and Comsol. So, Comsol is a multi physics integrated module where you can study different aspects electrical, thermal, biological, chemical, radiological, decay, generation, fine, fluid flow, precipitation, all sorts of this. So, you will have some 26 modules which can be used to do this. So, this is becoming big business where one group measures another one what it does? It does mathematical modeling to predict and whatever they predict goes in your DPR. What is DPR? Detailed project report, clear? So, this is where you have to show that I have monitored at few places, these are the results and if I put them in software, this is what the outcome is and the moment you submit your DPR things are fine, approval comes. But then what people like us do? We are not satisfied with DPR also, we challenge that and that is where the concept comes of validation, clear? So, software output, long term monitoring and mathematical models should give you the same results because we do not believe in GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. So, most of these softwares the type of inputs you are giving in the form of the parameters are question mark. So, the outcome which you are going to get from these software is also a big question mark. But it is a big business where people from the field, people from the software industry, they match their results, they try to validate it. Now, these are different school of thoughts in the world who work in these areas. So, the whole process is clear to you. Have you understood what is the basic idea behind studying environmental geotechnics. Now, from here onwards the entire thing becomes very complicated. So, that part I will avoid, I am not going to discuss much into how this modeling is done, but those of you who are interested can go through a lot of literature or can maybe pick up at any time in your life. Now, let me take you to a different direction now from this point onwards, the importance of the subject is clear. Now, from this point onwards, I have listed few things which are which become very important as a professional. The first thing is, I mean for any problem which you are going to deal with, there has to be a theory, philosophy and theory comes mostly from your concepts. So, people say that this batsman does not follow any copy book style of strokes, but I am sure the guy has already, he has been trained, he has practiced those strokes. And then a stage comes where he starts his own strokes later on in his life and then they are named after him. So, basically this part is very important those who are working in this area, they have a theory about a situation. For every situation, 
they create a case like the lawyers do. What do they do? They will hear everything and then they will create a case out of it. So, we scientists, engineers, we make a model. So, whatever I have been discussing until now, this is all model making. The second term is or the second aspect of the entire exercise is when you have a model, you want to generate data by doing some experiments. So, this is where the importance of lab test comes into the picture because in real life, you know, if you go to a site and you say I am, I will start doing monitoring and sampling and this and that is going to be extremely expensive and extremely time consuming. Another question is at how many places you are going to take the samples and at what depth and for how many kilometers you are getting these points. So, it is not easy to go to the site and collect the samples and say okay, I am just collecting samples. The question is how many samples, from what depth, from what radial distance and so on and how long because the material itself is changing over a period of time because of different activities. So, the best thing is you go to the site, collect some samples, bring them to the laboratory and study the response of these samples to the theory which you have developed and try to generate some data. Now, this is what is known as data generation. Then question comes, I might have developed some data in the laboratory which is not representative of the real life condition, in what way? I do not know whether you have questioned this or not. The type of samples of the soils on which you have worked, they were brought from the field maybe few years back or some time back and they were stored in a different ambient condition which is not prevailing at the site, clear. So, the type of response which you are going to expect from the soil is not going to be the same. This researchers normally talk about how to mature the soil, it is a very typical word which I am using. Once we bring a sample from the field, we mature it over a period of time, fine and we try to mature it in such a way that this becomes representative of the field conditions. So, when you perform field tests, the data is generated with an intention to verify them or to monitor things. There is a big subject in environmental geotechnology nowadays where we want sensing techniques, monitoring techniques for everything. You know, you create any structure, we want to measure the temperatures, humidity, we want to measure the concentration of chemicals, we want to measure the groundwater velocity, we want to measure whatever, vapor pressure, suction and so on. So, all these instruments have to be developed by people or you have to import them from different countries. It is so unfortunate that in India, we do not manufacture anything ourselves. So, small, small transducers, they would be costing about two and a half lakh rupees and we have to buy them only from western world, which many of us cannot afford. Anyway, so lab test data and the field test data, both are required to reinforce your theory or the model which you have created. Yeah, basically the type of results which I get from the laboratory, they are not very representative of the field conditions in terms of temperature, pressure and the stresses which are going to act on the. Suppose if I take out a sample from a depth of 10 meters and if I bring it to the lab, so the moment I have taken it out from the 10 meter depth, what has happened to the stress? Yeah, so these are all basically manipulations, but truly speaking that stress condition is not going to act on a sample which has been brought from the field to lab. So, when we talk about field test, the basic intention is to verify the results which I am getting in the laboratory. That is the intention or if I am taking samples from one place, I would like to verify this characteristic from other places also, generalization of the results. So, if you take some samples from some place, another sample from some place and if you can integrate the two results and you can show that this is a general phenomena, I will be very happy. The whole idea of generation of data is, I wanted to generate some empirical relationships. What are empirical relationships? You must be sick of remembering, you know, this Compton's equation, CC equal to point, no, 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 this, then LL minus this. This is your question from where these equations have come, not theory. They were developed from experiments. There are people who want to become very famous. So, what do they do? They generate their own equations by collecting lot of data 
and then they say this is the equation given by this guy and the profession uses it fine. So, whole idea of development of data is and there are companies which are selling data these days. Are you aware of this? It is a big business. If I want to buy some data, I have to buy it from people. For this material with this porosity, what will be permeability? Pay 25 dollars, I will give you the answer or you do the test. So, in a consulting lab where hundreds of samples come per day, how many tests you will be doing? Clear? Or suppose if I give you a project of let us say Navi Mumbai International Airport development, 1300 acre area, how many samples will be collecting? Which laboratory in the world is going to give you results in a timely fashion? So, this is where the empiricalism gets into the engineering and profession. So, the whole idea of doing these experiments is I want to generate empirical relationships which can be utilized for development of theory. So, linearly varying functions, non-linearly varying functions, proportionally varying functions, non-proportionally varying functions, exponential all these things whatever you mug up using equations you know y equal to e to the power minus x or whatever. Then because in today's world everything is on a computational platform. So, all this data people want to keep on a computational platform using some algorithms. Have you done ever SQL managing data and predicting? SQL is what is SQL? Can you please inform to others also? Sequential query language. So, we have a big database consisting of like many tables, hundred might be hundreds and fifties. We we try to like regulate data from manage data like they pick data, some data from one table, some from other tables and compare and give predict results mainly. Yes. Uh, truly speaking, this is not SQL. SQL is always sequential information which is being fed and the sequential information which you get out of it. Train has started from some station, it's a it's a knowledge base. What time it starts? Clear? And what is this movement can be fed into this? And I can I would like to ask a question: has the train started from this station and what time it is going to reach this station? Clear? So, sequential query language is always a sequence of the processes which is inbuilt in the system to get the information which I want. So, suppose if I give you a database of 6000 or 10000 soils which I have tested in my laboratory and out of which if I make a SQL platform and somebody asks me a question this is a soil from Sri Lanka with the color yellow fine and the void ratio is this much what will be it por its porosity? What will be its permeability? I need not to do any experiment. I have such a big database with me. I will feed in 2-3 words there color, porosity and my question is what is the permeability? So, I get the answer to my permeability. So, this is basically computer application which is where role of information technology is becoming very, very important in our subject. Civil engineers per se are the most you know versatile people who utilize information technologies to the maximum. Look at our activities starting from GPS to database management of any information and including the design of the buildings and the foundations or whatever. So, having done all these things ultimately what is that you want to leave for future generation? Judgment, experience. So, most of you must be hearing this term factor of safety. Civil engineers are fond of using the term FOS, factor of safety. What is factor of safety? Factor of safety is nothing but you know your grandparents or parents must be telling you do not do this, this is going to happen. Did you ever ask them a question? what is the probability of what you are saying is going to be correct or not. So, basically this is a probability based phenomena. Out of 100 times, 10 times this has happened or 90 times it has not happened, it becomes a experience and experience gets delegated in the form of a judgment. So, when technologists they work all this judgment and experience gets spelled in the form of a factor of safety term. So, we choose normally 33 percent factor of safety. Whatever the prop, uh, properties we are getting, we will make one third of that safe limit 
maybe some of the universities have kept 33 percent passing marks because of this only factor of safety. Anybody who appears for the exam will pass because of 33 percent marks. This is a magic number. But now what is happening because of this irresponsible way of selecting the factor of safety as 3? You are ignoring the strength of the material, you are ignoring the strength of the soil and you are over designing the systems. So, that is the difference when you go to different countries, you find very sleek structures, you know, go to Abu Dhabi, you will find extremely slender columns on which the bridges are standing, beautiful and come back to our country, you will find rivers, why it is so? So, as far as structure analysis is concerned, this is same everywhere, but then the factor of safety is being applied on what? What type of experience you have? Workmanship number one, number two is the materials. We know that what type of materials are being are going to be used and that goes in your psyche and then you pass a judgment. I am not going to accept this material because neither the workmanship is good nor the material which is going to be used for this system is going to be adequate and hence you see thick columns for the same purpose. So, this is very important, how would you use your knowledge in the entire subject. Now, having done this, I wanted to give you some idea about what are the prerequisite to do this type of analysis or the synthesis of the information. So, basically, uh, whatever science and technology you are aware of can be utilized to come out of these situations and whatever you are not aware of, you must learn. So, when we talk about environmental geotechnics, basically we talk about basic sciences, their application becomes very, very important. Sometimes I tell my students that engineering and technology follows science, but look at the condition and the, it is very pathetic, you know, the way science is being taught to us. We mug up most of the things at that time without realizing how to utilize them and then we do engineering and we become technologists one day without knowing how science is being used. So, then you have to revisit the entire thing and then try to understand how science and technology can be put together. Maybe the concepts of whatever you have studied in your undergraduate, soil mechanics, rock mechanics, geotechnical engineering, they are there. These are the basic norms, basic rules of the game that you should be knowing. You cannot violate them. But the most important thing is, uh, you know, one should have a very inquisitive and thoughtful mind. I am sure you must have realized in whole my discussion that is the game of the words and the game of interpreting a situation and this is where I keep telling everybody that environmental geotechnics type of things are practice of civil engineering which are having too much of infringement with let us say political issues, social issues, financial issues, societal issues, is it not? Everything put together. So, you have to be careful there because now you are applying these concepts into public domain. And there you have to be sure about, you know, how you are going to perceive things. So, perception becomes very, very important. I do not know whether you agree with this statement or not. You should have an inquisitive mind, thoughtful mind, at the same time a very unconventional thought process. So, your observation should be very peculiar. Most of the things are not known. And then how to execute them is becoming a big question. So, I wanted to spend some time on what is happening in environmental geotechnics, what are the recent trends, where we are heading to, whether you like it or not, but uh, material science is becoming a very important subject in technology as such, everywhere, in every part of technology material science is becoming very, very important. Civil engineers worked with soils, clays, groundwater, steel, wood, fiber, composites, glass, clear, concrete. So, you are the guys, we, are, we have been using materials since long, but now with the advent of nano and neo materials, what has happened? Civil engineering is becoming more and more fascinating. Any example where nano and neo materials are used in civil engineering, conventional civil engineering, you come across. I hope you understand what is neo materials, new materials, neo is new and nano very small nanoparticles is in fashion, everybody is using, chemical guys are using, metallurgists are using. We have been using it last 
since 5000 10000 years clay itself is a nano particle is a nano material but we have not gone into the too much into the particle level now this is where the realm of the entire thing is so there are people who have microscopes they keep the samples below that and they try to understand how these particles are arranged how these particles are communicating with each other and so on the second issue is mining there was a time when mining used to be a different activity altogether very proudly mining engineers used to say that it's not your realm of activities but today's world is otherwise unless geotechnical engineers are there mining cannot flourish you agree with this why it is so there is a role reversal which has occurred or you may say that civil engineers have encroached upon others domains exactly so you must i am sure you must have realized that unless the concepts of civil engineering and geotechnical engineering are applied mining cannot be conducted because there you have to understand the mechanics of the material nature of the resource and how it is going to behave suppose if i am excavating some mineral after excavation what will be the response of this material under in situ conditions and this becomes a multi phase system so water is there solids are there gases are there interaction again the interaction starts between all these three states and then you have to understand you know how the mining operation should be done to get the maximum desirable outputs sometimes we call it also as mineral engineering mineral processing though it is a chemical engineering related work but truly speaking there is lot of interaction which is required from environmental geotechnologists i am sure you must be realizing this the type of minerals you are mining out the stacking them and what is going to happen mining operations cannot be started unless you have a very clear idea about what type of minerals you are going to extract we are going to store them what will be the ill effect of these minerals to the nature or geo environment later on another interesting subject which is evolving nowadays is geo hazards see this is a new phase of civil engineering where people have not talked about these issues what do you mean by geo hazards can you can you name some yes earthquake is one landslides yes avalanche yes very good cyclones sinkholes yes hurricane cyclones yes fine tsunami yes you are right tsunami tectonic motion that causes earthquake he said is it not floods yes you are right so flood is also a geo hazard why what flooding does start from soil erosion to this to that flattening of the river beds what not clear all these things come so geo hazard is becoming a big subject in civil engineering and i'm sure you must have realized the type of words you are coining geo hazards are of two types so one category is man made another one is natural now there is a big question whether earthquakes are man made or they are natural both correct why can you substantiate your answer have you heard about this famous phenomena in kerala it happens north india it happens you do blasting somewhere what will happen vibrations ground movement clear tremors eduki dam is always a newspaper why tehri dam these are man made tremors and man made tremors are nothing but a sort of earthquake waves how about other other ones floods natural phenomena is a man made phenomena now the way it is happening since last 5 years everybody is confused whether it is a natural flooding or it is a man made flooding So, if you go into the root cause analysis, you will realize that most of your sewers are choked. Most of the watershed areas have already been utilized in such a manner that the drainage pattern has been completely ignored. So, the flood, which was supposed to be a natural disaster or a natural geo hazard, is nowadays being considered mostly as a man-made system. You know why? What is the consequence of this? See, everything has a consequence in today's words. Can you think of why I am emphasizing on this thing? 
purely related with money. So this is what we do. We are advocates. Suppose a claim comes. Claim means what? What type of claim? You constructed a structure and every structure has to be insured for some money, clear? And tomorrow something happens, then what will happen? Why did you insure your structure? When you buy a car, you insure it the very first day, is it not? Car would cost you how much? 10 lakh rupees maximum, 15, 20, 50 lakhs. Of course, I am not talking about crores. But think of these structures which are being constructed and the infrastructure which is constructed is definitely going to cost you few thousands of crores. So now there is a big debate going on whether these claims should be settled or not. Are you realizing the issues? And this is where you require people who have knowledge of civil engineering and they are practicing civil engineering in public domain. Unfortunately, we do not have any. So, this is one of the issues which is I am finding very critical and most of these cases ultimately land up in the court of law where somebody has to defend them. You are constructing a tower today and tower suppose it topples and some people die, clear? Now, this is a clear cut case of ignorance, negligence poor quality of construction, fine. Now, who is going to advocate the entire thing? I mean, you should have studied the slope stability analysis, you should have studied the structural analysis, you should have studied the wind loads, you should have studied the type of pressures which are going to act on the system and why the system has failed. So, you go beyond computations which you do normally in your exercise book and you try to make a case out of it which is going to be presented somewhere to win or lose a case which has lot of monetary significance. Are you realizing this? So, in this world of finance, civil engineers are playing very important role, though they are at the foundation level, they do not get exposed directly. But almost all the reports are normally shared with these guys or they write these type of issues for claims. Another good example is you are creating let us say infrastructure and tsunami comes. You know what is the cost of settlement? Imagine apart from the loss of life, I am just talking about the loss of property only. So, these are the claims which companies are nowadays trying to settle for which you require the knowledge of civil engineering. Landslides and what happened in Uttaranchal 2-3 years back and the amount of you know losses both in terms of infrastructure damage, life of loss, loss of life and so on. Ultimately, if you put everything together, it was a disaster of few thousands of crores. So, geohazard mitigation is becoming very important. One, one thing which uh, nobody has talked about in geohazard, yeah, somebody talked about avalanche. Have you heard about cloud burst? What is cloud burst? Excess rainfall within a very short duration of time, excess rainfall during a very short duration of time, of time. That means, rainfall intensity is so high that it might trigger avalanche, it might trigger landslide, it might trigger mud flow. What is mud flow? Yeah, but in most of the Hindi movies they show it very nicely, you know mud flow. So, what happens? The top layer of the soil becomes a slurry and it flows all along, fine. So, now suppose if you have complete structure, infrastructure sitting on these type of systems, where cloud burst takes place, fine, and the material loses strength and the entire slope gets washed out. But now I am giving you a situation, you think of, you know, and we need experts, like there are so many claims, every company, you know, every finance company, I do not know how many claims I deal with, my goodness, one life is less. Each claim would be 10 crores per day, 100 crores per day. Look at the whole gamut of the activities. So, all this is falling under the hazards, all sorts of hazards, man-made, yeah. yeah. Natural man-made. So, like if in some of the insurance, it is said that like the act of God. Yes, I mean like suppose you are constructing a building and something goes wrong and the building topples on next person's property or maybe you are constructing a tower, 
who is responsible? Is it the act of God or this is man made? So, all these legislations will come very soon like you should you should you should stand up in parliament, you should stand up and you should make these rules. So, there is no answer I mean I cannot tell you what but then interpretations have to be done. Good example is dams, why these Medha Patkar and all they became so famous. You are constructing a dam, now the first question is whether dam is good for the country or it is a it is bad for the country, you agree because there are pros and cons. You are getting electricity, water storage, but look at the sabotage. Imagine something happens to Bhakra Dam, what will happen to the entire North India, fine. Even you need not to do anything, little bit of contamination in the entire water of some heavily toxic material. Look at our water bodies, the way they are open to public access, there is no control and this water we are drinking. So, all these type of sabotages are important in today's world anyway. So, I do not have any answer, but yes, I mean you have to apply your mind and then you will get earmarked in your profession that he is the guy who tackles these type of cases only like criminal lawyers you have or you know <laughs> civil lawyers you have, defense lawyers, you will become like that, you will have a position in the society. I was talking about you know information technology, artificial intelligence, expert systems, the expert systems and civil engineering have been used since long, artificial neural net intelligence, ANN, some of you must be using in your thesis and solving your problems. SQL is one of the examples of AI, IT and expert systems in this in the design and construction. I am sure you must have got an F exposure of bio geo interface, my postdoc and other students we have discussed a lot about bio geo interface which is becoming a fashion in today's world. Molecular mechanics, uh, molecular see civil engineers are the best possible molecular biologists and they also do if you type on internet, you will get lot of civil engineers who are dealing with the you know bio inspired systems, that is the key word. Check it out on net, who are the guys working in bio inspired systems. Then this fire protection engineering has become a part of our subject. Any two instances where you think this fire engineering has become a part of civil engineering, World Trade Center and so when these structures are undergoing these type of thermal stresses, what will happen to their masonry? foundations, you know the entire system. So, this has become a very important subject now, uh, fire protection engineering related to infrastructure. Infrastructure engineering I think I have discussed quite a lot, land creation, dredging, reclamation, formation of islands and so on. This is also a very interesting uh, field in which you know our intervention is required, preservation, restoration and rehabilitation of monuments and the buildings of significance. Any famous example? Taj restoration has not started yet truly speaking. Famous example related to geotechnical engineering, Ajanta Elora Pisa, Pisa, Pisa tower. Pisa tower actually they have now restored and there are a lot of cases which are uh, coming these days uh, where you know some building is sinking because this was developed on a sinkhole or on a poor foundation system the entire building collapses. In Delhi it happened about a year back, in Bombay after every rainy season it happens, it has become a very common thing. So, conservation and restoration is also becoming a part of a civil engineering profession or I do not know the way I look at it is like this, I have done most of the work for ASI and restoration of all these buildings and uh, caves particularly. This is the future of civil engineering, my lab was a part of mass mission, we got the samples, we tested and we submitted our report. Now, this is the future of uh, geotechnical engineering and civil engineering and I am sure you must be agreeing with me that not many are trained for these type of studies, in fact we are not aware of that these things also we can do. So, Arctic is cold region geomechanics, I think I was giving an example that expeditions go to Arctic region every year, where these guys are going to live, what type of foundation you are going to provide them. These systems are dynamic, I think we discussed in one of the classes that ice cover keeps on changing, fluctuating because of the environmental conditions. So, where your scientists are going to live in Antarctica, who will construct hotels for them, who will construct base for them. Kargil, 
Le, Ladakh, these areas. Imagine, I mean, you are sitting in Bombay, it is not the end of the civilization. So, we have to provide civilizations to these guys. And then extraterrestrial civil engineering. Extraterrestrial civil engineering would conform to lunar mission, Martian missile mission. I mean, who knows tomorrow maybe it could be Jupiter or Mercury or whatever. So, this is where actually we will expand slowly and slowly. I do not know whether you have given a serious thought to this or not. Environmental geotechnics makes you a very good detective because you are trying to see something which is not very visible. See beneath the ground how contaminants are spreading, can you see that? But then you should have intuition. You should be able to tell you know just by maybe dreaming in night that well this is what is going to happen or this is not going to happen because I have given you this treatment. So, forensic engineering is becoming a very big branch of engineering in civil engineering. What is forensic? Investigations related to eh, cause, cause of something. Forensic is always death because of excessive drinking, ex drug uh, death because of doping, injection of let us say you know medicines, toxic element, poisoning and so on. Finding out a cause of something is forensic. Dams have failed, why they have failed? Building has collapsed, why it has collapsed? Ground has settled, why it has settled? Most of these problems are becoming forensic in nature and forensic issues are evidence which you collect based on your intuitive knowledge and concepts of the subject to put up in a legal affairs. See imagine this subject is so powerful and I always tell my scholars that it puts you in a different orbit. It makes you completely different than the entire mass. It is not only I am preaching. I want some of you to become forensic engineers, forensic experts because as you rightly said when, when you are doing investigations, these investigations are not, not limited to certain parameters, clear? You will try to inspect each and everything. Even if there is a blood clot on the cloth, you will try to find out DNA. Similarly, we were discussing if you remember the other day their soil samples are taken out and their DNA analysis is done. But yes, I think my dream is some of you should become very good forensic engineers. We need people like you, intelligent minds, very sharp minds with good concepts of. So, if somebody says there is a leakage coming out of the landfill, you should go and monitor it and prove this wrong tomorrow. You say nothing is leaking or you should say yes, this guy is saying nothing is leaking, but this is the concentration of chemicals coming into the environment. So, this will gain definitely a lot of momentum in days to come, energy. I think we have already discussed enough. Of course, in the previous lecture and uh, some of my PhD scholars must have talked about gas hydrates, coal bed methane, CBM, shale gas, carbon sequestration. Everybody is trying to sequest carbon dioxide into aquifers. So, this is going to be a big business tomorrow. Like everybody will have its own pump, suck carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, pump it into the aquifers. Two benefits you get. What? One is carbon dioxide is reducing from the environment. Second thing, you are recharging your hydrocarbon reservoirs. So, this is where a lot of technology and application of soil mechanics and foundation engineering and geotechnical engineering is going to be.